Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create film courses to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by uh, Giles uh, Nutchins, whose work includes Enola Holmes, Hot, Hell or High Water, uh, Montana Story, and many more fil- great films. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I guess, uh, can you tell us how you got into uh, being a cinematographer? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, I had a, like every, anybody that gets into it, hopefully they have a little bit of luck as well as, as well a little bit of de- determination. But um, yeah, I actually saw, weird enough, I, when I was 10 years old, I saw a film crew, a documentary film crew on, um, when I, when I, uh, at work uh, in Wales, unbelievably. And I was only 10, I was very impressed by, the sort of, to be honest, the, the macho type environment that was there was, you know, a camera, camera with a handheld 16 mil camera leaning over the side of an aqueduct to try and get a picture. You know, and the aqueduct was about 200 feet high. And I thought, you know, with the assistant holding onto him, security in those days was a little looser. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's a, that, looks, that looks like a fun job. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of had that in my head pretty much all the way through my adolescence. Uh, and then I did when I was, you know, 17, I applied to the BBC. Uh, it took me three years to get a post in there. It wasn't the post that I wanted to get. Uh, and about two years to transfer into the post that I did want, which was an assistant film cameraman at the time. Mm-hmm. And so when I was about 21, I then became a, a trainee assistant film cameraman and started working through the ranks uh, as a as a clapper loader, then a focus puller, and then and then a cameraman. But, um, but my intention initially was to work in documentaries and I was very uh, attracted to it being film uh, in some ways, not just because of the images, because I was very, I was very good with mechanics. They were, it made a lot of sense to me. So a film camera was, is basically like a sewing machine, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very mechanical object and I could relate to the object, to the physical object, as well as what it was trying to achieve. And uh, that, that sort of connection with the idea that you know, there's a strip of film with a real image on it on a print uh, was very, very attractive. I mean, it brings up a question as whether or not, if it were digital, allowing that we're so used to digital images, whether I would have been quite as interested. What was I, I was interested in about, if you like, the, you know, the physical reproduction on a piece of film of an image that was seen in front of myself. Uh, and that's, that's basically how I got into at least into film to start off with. And obviously that was working in the BBC, mainly on documentaries on 16 millimeter and then becoming a focus puller for one of their cameramen there. Uh, The jump to cinema happened uh, about 10 years later when the BBC started to make everybody redundant, uh, reduce their film crews, basically out of Ealing Film Studios, they got rid of 51 film crews out of 52. Uh, I worked in another department in Bristol and then they, uh, we all, we all left at that point. And at that point, I made the transition into shooting features. Well, it's, it, first, I want to, I appreciate that you refer to it as a sewing machine, because yeah. that's how I describe the uh, moviola, because of the registration pin, <laughs> yeah, the way yeah, it yeah. runs like yeah. a sewing machine. Um, how, so, because you started on docs in, in Super 16. So how do you think that influenced you uh, as a cinematographer now in this digital world? So I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that it does, particularly in the digital world, what it does is train you in a certain way. So I, what, what I don't know is how people get to understand about how to construct a story without having gone through that process, but obviously do. Some of my, some of my great, uh, good friends of extremely good DPs that went to film school or certainly didn't go through the process that I did uh, and never, uh, never really done a documentary as such. Um, for me, the idea of, of working on 60 millimeter was the independence of working in a crew that was basically three of us, myself, you know, the, the camera person, an assistant and a sound, sound recordist. Uh, and the idea that you would go out and you would make effectively a small film, whether even if you were working on news, you would make a small film that would last for two, 
uh, two minutes. You worked on documentary, you'd go away for weeks and you'd make a 30 minute or an hour's documentary. But ultimately, obviously there was the presence of a director, but the as the only person that was seen through the camera, it meant that you were responsible for producing something that would cut together well, uh, that had certain elements of continuity into it. So it's a very, very global look on how to construct a story, as well as the technical aspect of it, which is obviously exposing, lighting, uh, you know, fret, co composing in a way that you like. Uh, so there's all, all of that visual artistic side, but there's also the practical side of uh, narrative storytelling. As I say, whether it should be, uh, whether it were um, a simple new story or something more complex. And I think, and I think that was the, I mean, an amazing start to it. And I hope I sort of still retain that. And it, I don't think it's so surprising that uh, the people that I work with, such as Michael Winterbottom or Dave McKenzie, have a somewhat documentary approach to their type of filmmaking and the fact that that works for them. There are other people that are extremely good at this, obviously people like Barry Ackroyd, who uh, started off in documentaries and was extremely talented and got very, very far in the film industry, obviously. So I, Chris Menges was another one. There, there was, there's a lot of people that came up through that line and I probably didn't have quite their expertise that they had before I flipped into cinema, into fictional narrative, but they, but that made, I, I think, as a grounding uh, for becoming a filmmaker rather than just a DP or a camera operator. Um, I think that was pretty invaluable. You know, because you, you sort of mentioned this, you learned a lot about storytelling in the process at working at the BBC. So what, um, what would you say, you know, is something that you learned in storytelling from making documentaries that um, you don't see a lot of young people picking up maybe because of the way it's taught nowadays? Well, I, I see, it's hard for me, for me to say that they, that they can't do that or they don't do that. I mean, and look, it's, you know, it's a, bit, it's a bit like a stills photographer saying, you know, you're looking back on the great stills photographer like Cartier Presson, it's very difficult to, to, to actually compose an image and find that image to happen when you've got a sync, when you've got a plate camera and you've got one chance at something, or, you know, compared to somebody that's going to press a button and take 50 images and you're going to find exactly the right moment out of that. You know, I, I, there's not one that's the correct way of doing it. Obviously, the possibility of getting that great moment is much greater if you're, if, you, if you're running through a lot of images on the camera. And I don't think, yes, some people in the past had, had an amazing capacity to capture images that were almost impossible to capture because they just had a sense about being in the right place at the right time or having the right composition at the right time. Um, so the idea that the young film, young DPs or young filmmakers don't have that capacity, I think would be, is a little bit hard on them because I suspect they also have a, um, they have a, a critical education, which is much stronger. I went straight into the business, you know, I never, never did any form of studies. Whereas hopefully they've gone through that critical process of analyzing other films, analyzing narrative, as well as analyzing the structure, you know, the, the mise-en-scene, the images, how they look, how they feel. Um, because obviously that is an important part of our job. Sometimes directors say to me, I don't know, you, you know, you're very, very aware of the importance of narrative uh, in terms of the way I actually work. I'm always asking about the narrative, the narrative crux of each scene, and I'm trying to get there with images. But I, I can't imagine there are that many DPs that are working at a reasonably high level, or at least in cinema, who don't have that capacity now, because I just think it's such a fundamental part of of what I do as a DP and actually in a way that's what differs a DP from a technician who just literally follows what's what's happening in front of them you know so so I, I hope that young filmmakers do have that formation uh, and even if they do have a lot more material to work for work with than we probably had when we had you know 10 minute magazines on a 16 mil camera and therefore had to think about every time we turned on the camera. Um, hopefully they've got a lot more, you know, the ratio, you know, the shooting ratios are much, much higher, but hopefully that will, when they come down and actually put that and see that edited, they'll understand which parts were important in terms of uh, in terms of telling the story that they're supposed to be telling. Um, I do th I think personally, uh, I have a relationship with certain directors because I'm not sure that I have any more capacity than anybody else to understand 
you know, the narrative importance of what we do with an image. But, but on the other hand, at least I understand that <laughs> it is an extremely, you know, ult ultimately a film won't work if the narrative doesn't work. Narrative doesn't make sense. The film's not going to work. It doesn't matter how good it looks. That uh, that's not actually going to going to help people enjoy the thing they're watching or be or be informed by whatever they're watching. So so I do think in that sense in that sense um, my balance between the importance of the image and the importance of telling the story that's actually going to keep an audience interested. Uh, is relatively good in my case, and 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 to put on top of that, I'm sure there are some DPs that are just 100% concentrated on the images, and probably are some of the better DPs on the planet because because that's where their concentration is as an absolute in terms of being totally uncompromising. For example, a very simple thing is like you know, there are, I can see the difference between when Bob Richardson goes out and shoots because of the time of day that he shoots a scene. I can I can see the difference in that compared to what happens when I'm shooting with Michael Winterbottom, for example, where we shoot a massive amount of material in a very short amount of time. And Michael has his own reasons for shooting with the light in a certain time of day, uh, normally which had to do with schedule. So obviously I'm never going to be achieve, able to achieve that quality of light or that control of light that maybe you can achieve on a on a bigger film where that seems to be more important whether that helps the narrative or not is the big question so how do you get on the same page with the director then because you you've you've worked with some directors many times so what is what is your secret i guess or how do you make sure you understand what they want uh, i i mean i think i think originally like all young dps i was probably as difficult as anybody else to work with because we're all a little stressed because we're all sort of fighting our own technical weaknesses uh you know we, we all have to learn you know i mean everybody learns i i still think that you know i've got to a, i've been doing it for 30 years and i now sort of feel that uh i could take on pretty much anything i actually thought i could take on pretty much anything when i was 35 i just didn't realize i couldn't uh so so that you know that's the thing with experience you actually realize how how little you know until you get to a point where you're actually comfortable with what you're doing, where it suddenly becomes a, a creative thing. I mean, I think now at the moment, the reason why, uh, you know, I, I do work with specific people, some is historical, I started with them, or I have a long relationship. My relationship with Michael Winterbottom is very, is very young. Uh, I did two films with him in the last two or three years, it's hard, it's hard to know with the pandemic, we seem to have lost two years, but probably three years ago. Uh, and And the great thing about that was that you know, Michael works with me because I'm relatively cooperative. Uh, I try to do what's needed for for the film and for the story, and you know, at the cost of of I, I can't say the quality of the lighting, but the type of lighting that we do because we work with tiny crews, and obviously it's very very fast. So that process of having you know been able to adjust very very rapidly, and also hopefully. From time to time, the idea that everything has to happen as a certain amount of improvisation on the spot, which goes back to my documentary beginnings, um, that that makes makes it potentially I can't speak for him e sort of relatively easy to work with me, and and so I think that's what happens is that you start to get a relationship. One, there's a point where the relationship changes between. They're, you know, they're all still my bosses. I still do what, <laughs> what they need and what they want. Uh, but there is a point where you have either more experience or much experience. And it is true that all of the people I work with, Deepa Mehta's uh, a little older than me, but generally they're around about the same age. So that we started together, we developed together. And also we have the same, if not cultural references, at least the same life experience reference because of a certain age. And I think that makes it a much more that balance between the two of us and the respect for both sides, because all of those people have a massive amount of experiences and have done good films, the respect from both sides makes it a much easier and much pleasanter process. I do, I do hear occasionally, you know, because I work with a lot of different assistants all over the world, uh, you know, of tensions between directors and DPs. And yes, of course, I've experienced that in the past, but but sometimes the things they describe, I can't even imagine how that could possibly work in terms of <laughs> in terms of producing a good result. But apparently, apparently, it does. For, for me, the relationship with those directors is the is the fact that 
we actually like each other, you know, that I actually respect them and I like them as human beings as well as, you know, have a, I do have a huge amount of respect for the people that I do work for. Yeah, well, this might not even be a question, I guess you could say, but yeah. like if you're, because, you know, I think about that you talk about the work with, with Winterbottom and I think, well, he's done Greed, which is um, very funny in the comedy and you guys are working yeah. on a, a palace, um, 1930s Palestine under British colonial rule. When you're shifting between genres or styles of uh, film, does that change your approach to the to the lighting or to the, like how you design your lighting, or does it? Do you find that it's it's similar from film to film? You just are adjusting for you know the story. Uh, so I think I think what's more important, and I think I think so. Sometimes I hear DPs that aren't very happy about talking about that, but the you know the. There are lots of things that affect what happens to the image. <laughs> There's, you know, the, the speed of shoot, the time that you have, the money that you have, the size of crew that you have. Uh, and not necessarily when I say, oh, you've got a big crew, you're going to produce amazing results. That doesn't necessarily work. Sometimes you get better results by having a smaller crew. So the so there's there's a lot of external factors that actually affect the the end image. You know, when we're all sitting in a small room with two people talking and you have to light them nicely because it's a romance scene, that basically within a small lit room and limited space it doesn't matter how big your budget is or how small your budget is it comes down to your simple ability you know as a as a as a dp um, but in other cases uh the there are there is a lot of effect caused by the environment that you're working in and also you know it, it can be as simple as you have cooperative actors or uncooperative actors. Um, there's lots of other situations, you know, if big people in England have, you know, if you if they want to make a funny, a sunny film, that's going to be hard for them because it rains there a lot. I mean, there's, there's a lot of external factors that actually have influenced the, the end look of a film. Uh, I, I personally think the biggest factor is the, the desire of the director for a film to look in a certain way or the desire of a director for let's just keep moving and uh, let's get it in the can. And really the approach becomes the most defining thing. So for example, with Michael, Michael's approach, Michael isn't exactly dogma because we do have a small amount of lighting, but we work with, um, you know, between one and three electrician stroke grips. So, you know, it's a tiny crew. So the limitation of what we can do, I don't often, I think I've only worked done one day with Michael's when we went, Michael, when we had an HMI. So the type of lighting that you're doing is adjusted by the type of the, the speed that Michael works at. Um, so, so that's one thing. With David McKenzie, it's a very different thing because we, David, David and I, even though we don't do a massive amount of preparation in terms of location scouting and things like that, but we, what we do do is, is David and I always spend generally a week together uh, and either he comes over to Spain and spends some time with me, or when I was living in France, he came to, to do that. And we and we literally spend a week going through every single every single scene, but talking about what the scene means. So it's not really about talking about what the what the scene will look like. It's about what the scene feels like. And and so through that process, and we at the end of it, we make notes and we sort of come up with a basic you know shot breakdown, which as usual, tends to get thrown away when you shoot. But, but, the, but the process between us has already happened in the sense that by the end of that week, we sort of know where we're aiming. And we certainly know where it, what we're trying to create emotionally for the audience. And translating that to an image uh, is then the next process. Uh, and I think David would be, although he doesn't interfere at all with my lighting when I'm lighting, uh, if he had a specific request, he would come to me uh, about that and we would develop that together uh, likewise he's very he's very good with me in terms of giving me free reign about framing uh, but he also knows that I'm also aware that there are narrative elements within the framing that are very important to transmit to the audience and and he will pass that over to me but because we have we've had that week of, com of communication just the two of us which is very very rare to get that much amount of time uh, and that's why we do it away and way before we start pre-production uh, I think that then there is an adaptation to the style of each particular film there is definitely a, a look at it in that way now how do you how do you like to work with your colorist because colorists in the last 20 years have become a huge part 
of help like of assisting the cinematographer in crafting the image in some way where usually the cinematographers guiding you or guiding them so how do you like to um, approach working with them and make to make sure you get the final look uh, well, there's two. There's two. There's there's two parts of that. There's one, one is the colorist, but obviously the person that you're dealing with on the set on digital. I mean, they do sh occasionally still shoot on film, which is very different. But the um, is the DIT. So so therefore you've already sort of started up a relationship with the <laughs> with the electronic medium uh, and how you actually can present it. And obviously within you know in cinematography now, then we all have to decide. You know the LUTs that uh, the lookup tables, the LUTs that we're using. Uh, so, allowing that I came from film and allowing that basically we were shooting not all the time because we in film we controlled contrast. The only contrast we can control we had because it pre DIs there was no way of controlling contrast. We could only do in the timing of the film. We could only do you know color shifts, overall color shifts. And overall exposure we couldn't even when we started we couldn't even do what we call a dynamic which was a change of exposure within a shot that was just not possible uh, so we all got used to exposing the negative at a certain point you know which would be called a mid light um, in order to in order to control the contrast or the latitude of the image so it was controlled through lighting and obviously through uh, negative exposure so for example with the negative exposure we overexposed it uh, it would then work at higher printer lights, which would then give it more contrast, um, generally. Uh, so, so we, you know, obviously with a DI, we have a, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing tool. Uh, so, but what that sets you up to do when you're shooting normally to get the full range of latitude of the film negative, you would make sure that your exposure was right down the middle, you know, and Kodak would have a, each laboratory would have a set of lights, which would indicate that, which everybody used to call 30 across, but they were different different num uh, numbered lights, which you would then know that you were bang in the middle of the exposure range, except it's uh, approved by Kodak. Uh, so having had that as, a, as an upbringing, it seemed to make sense to me that what you were trying to do with the lighting was produce exactly what you wanted to see on the final run. So, for example, I so and I had this conversation with Araflex at the beginning. And I said, I don't quite understand. I mean, why can't you just where's the standard? You know, and they said, no, 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 there's too much flexibility. You can't, you know, it's like, you know, you just put the light you want. And I said, no, but where's the standard? And of course, then they produced, which they've been modifying, they, which is what I now use, an Ari Classic standard LUT. I think they call it the Ari Classic, uh, which is which doesn't really affect the contrast of I mean, it puts it back into a normal space, the sort of space, it's hard to say, that the hard, like the space that you would see with your eye, but more or less in terms of that latitude, it enhances a maximum latitude without making it look flat. So it doesn't, it has a normal contrast in it. So allowing that I do that and I like to that, it means that the job for the DIT and the job for the colorist later on is not dealing with the application of a whole load of different LUTs that might've been, attached to certain certain sequences uh, but sort of trying trying to work down that mid line so that when I get there it's as close the image is as close to what I want to see but all done through lighting rather than done through manipulation or contrast manipulation or color manipulation either with either with the DIT or in, or in the color suite you know in the DI suite by alert now that only goes for, because there are certain looks that you can't get, obviously, by just applying a standard LUT because there's a massive amount of latitude on, I use the Alexa, on the Alexa. So in the same way that we went into film processes, which could have been ENR, for example, you know, uh, uh, which happened on the print, skip bleach, which happened on the negative in terms of manipulating contrast either uh, in the first, you know, when we process the film or when we process, uh, process negative, when we process positive. So these, you know, we, in, in film world, we had a manipulating system to say, to, so to say a lot didn't exist in that way, it didn't exist in that way, but to create that effect, to create that high contrast effect, for example, you have to apply a lot on top. It has to be something, which is something that we're looking at a little bit on certain sequences in Enola, uh, because simply the, you know, the, the image itself is just too good. It's too, the Alexa image is too capable of resolving things. Its latitude is 
is is fantastic, particularly at the bottom end. So, so my way of working is that we stay down the middle. Now, when you get there are certain things that remember remember even though we do have lots of time to shoot on certain films with certain big budgets, <laughs> there's still there's still if you want a lot of freedom in terms of camera movement, there are still things that can be improved in the DI. You know, you can still window faces. Uh, for example, you know, if you've got a black actor next to a very white actor, then getting them both balanced out really nicely in a really fast way, but giving that camera all of that when we're not dealing with just a, a set of close-ups, generally you're gonna have to place the exposure in the middle. So you're gonna have to do a little bit, you know, of bringing down the white person and, you know, making sure you've got the detail on the black person afterwards. So it, th those things are quite, you know, th there, there is a process that happens uh, in the DI that's absolutely necessary. And of course, all of the, but I would always say that, you know, if you should be 90% of the way there by the, by the time you hit that. You should be about to apply your luck and look at the film and think, wow, it looks pretty good. You know, there'll be a certain amount of balancing up, particularly if you're using multiple cameras, but it, you know, you should be able to get very, very close. I've done a, what well, I did a TV pilot where they didn't even time the TV pilot. And I was, I was absolutely shocked. There was no timing period for it. They just put out the dailies. And uh, unfortunately it was one of my best bits of work with David McKenzie, so it, it felt okay. I was very happy about it that it went out. I was very proud that they didn't need to do anything else, but that other 10% does make a difference. And I, and I think that that's another interesting thing. I think that 10% are tiny touches that maybe I would notice or another DP would notice, but there are things that really can enhance the narrative. So bringing, bringing, bringing up one element, you know, whether, it, whether or not it be you know, the, uh, the murder weapon or something like that, bringing that up and making that brighter and making it more intense uh, can obviously help the narrative. There are certain elements within a frame that are impossible to light, you know, unless you spend hours and hours and hours on each individual shot uh, at the time, which can be really helped in the DI. You know, the other thing is pulling people out and knocking the background back is really quite important. So my relationship, although I've up till now I've uh, I've been changing changing uh, colorists all the time because it tends to be uh, there's only one colorist in Los Angeles that I've worked with twice. But on for for example, Anola Holmes too, because we'd sort of set up the way it felt, even though this the the new one is more dramatic than Anola Holmes one. We you know, Rob Pitsy, who's the colorist, has a good idea of what both I like and what the director likes. And I think that will be a very, very useful thing because he's also got that in a, his head. And also he's a man that can understand, you know, where the narrative point of a scene is and therefore can just drive us with the image. But I don't expect, except for there are one or two sequences where we've joint, jointly we've dis decided that they need to be pushed into a more contrasty space which normally I resist a bit, but I think it's appropriate for the narrative in this particular case, then most of the things is just, it's just a case of refining. It's a case of refining, you know, somebody has a little bit too much green or a little too much magenta in their face, you know, slight tweaks so that it becomes out exactly where you want. But basically uh, it, it is that for, for me and the colorist um, to, to try and keep it as close as to what we've done originally. I, I really appreciate that uh, you talk positively of the Ari uh, cameras because I remember learning on an Ari VL <laughs> yeah. back in the day. Um, so to hear that they're still going strong is good. No, uh, so I, I mean, I think, I think I think all of us have got used to, you know, I, I used to work with between, because when I did a lot of anamorphic, when I was in, a, an, and I always shot Panavision anamorphic just simply because their lenses were very good. Um, and so we'd got, we'd got used to that and we all loved Panavision flares and things like that. And it was the big going to America, shooting over there and shooting, shooting Panavision meant that you just sort of made it, <laughs> you know, the, the, the cameras were big, the lenses were big and everything worked really well. So, so I, I did that. And then Aeroflex obviously then came up with uh, the LT and then they produced their, you know, master prime anamorphic. So suddenly they, they were in a zone where, uh, where they, you know, they could compete with Panavision, and because I'd all, you know, I'd grown up on Aeroflex and Aeroflex SR, uh, and then and then obviously on, you know, uh, all whatever, you know, whether there were five three fives, STs, and then LTs, you you sort of get used to the Aeroflex process. You get used to be able to see through the viewfinder really well. So when the when the Alexa came along, 
for in fact until until we went onto the large format the lf uh, i was still using uh, the optical viewfinder on the alexa so i mean the only slight problem was it was a beast so for a lot of handheld it was it made you quite tough um but and also because you can't expose through the viewfinder because it's not connected to the to the image in any way but you could actually see exactly what you were doing you weren't limited by the quality of the viewfinder um which i find slightly slightly frustrating with with the alexa but now that we've gone on to the L lf that everything's with electronic viewfinders and we've sort of got used to that uh it is still dif difficult judging lighting through the viewfinder because the light the viewfinder is very very limited um the monitor in the viewfinder is limited compared to you know a bigger uh, a class monitor so but but they're things that you get used to so now i have one last question for you you know we've been stuck in this pandemic for two years now and a yep. lot of people have turned to streaming services during that time for entertainment if they get stuck indoors is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the last two years that you think people should check out if they're stuck indoors no, I think there's lots of lot, there's lots of movies that people should be checking out. But you know the separation between you know the the one thing I did because I never watched TV series before. I mean, I, I was never a big avid TV watcher, but part, mainly because I was working in cinema. My, if you like, my peers were working in cinema, so therefore my if the competition, the people that I had to have a reference to, were producing movies. So I would see them, see them in cin in the cinema. I always thought I've I've always had. You know, I shot for the big screen. Uh, the people that I were up against were uh, people that were shooting for the big screen too. So it was the first time that I started to see a uh, television series. So I remember watching Chernobyl in uh, during which my, my sister's a big avid fan so of TV series. So she tells me what to watch. But, but you know, and that was, despite the fact that it was depressing as hell, um, it, you know, it was, you realize the quality of the image that people were doing, you know, the quality of the filmmaking was, was amazing. Uh, and, that, and that did actually take me by surprise about how good uh, television series were because television series for me were a bit like a TV movie, which tended to be overlit 35 mil. So to see the quality and loads of people have talked about break, breaking bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually got into Spanish TV series that all fantastic for the first, uh, for the first series. And then they sort of turn into what we call a telenovela for the second one, which is a soap. Uh, so they sort of get more outlandish as you go along. Uh, and and I and I really enjoyed that, but they're not they're not great image based films, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the work on oh, it's called Casa de Papel, um, Money Heist, Money Heist, yeah, yeah. yeah, Money, yeah. Money Heist. In, uh, so so you know, there's great work on there. I mean, fantastic work on that. So so there are, there are films generally in a lot of the TV series, you know, the quality of cinematography. But I think that generally, I think the quality of cinematography at the moment is extremely high. Uh, so certainly for TV series with, you know, a streaming TV series with a certain amount of budget behind them, as well as cinema, uh, people are producing excellent work. It doesn't, you don't, you just have to go back to uh, films that we thought were amazing films and probably sometimes nominated for Oscars for photography. And you go back and you look at, and often overlit 35 mil, and or very traditional in terms of i don't want to name many films because that sounds I'm bad, like i'm bad mouthing people but a lot of the big adventure films which were major motion pictures you know with a massive budget you you look at the lighting it and you think how did they do that why did they do that you know and these were the people that i respected obviously growing up because they were the people that you looked up towards it's just that cinematography since people, and also, you know, with cameras of the quality of the Alexa, where it has the ability to record detail as well as being sharp, but record, you know, information at a low level, has just liberated people to be much, much, much more creative because they're not tied down by the, like it or not, and I think I was relatively brave, uh, even as a young DP, when I did Young Adam, I mean, I remember taking a night shoot to a point where there's almost nothing there sort of regretting it, but, but, you know, with a lot of confidence, but nowadays the fact that you can, you've got a much bigger indication, which is not just a monitor, but a waveform to know how much information is there. And of course you can pull out detail and clean it up later, which we can never do, uh, means that people are a lot braver. 
they're a lot braver. They're night, basically night scenes, for example. Yeah. I mean, it literally is night and day compared to what we did 20 years ago because we had to cover our backs because if we didn't give the film negative enough, enough exposure, then it, it all came out muddy and grainy and it really, really wasn't very pleasant. So uh, a few people you know, uh, managed to make amazing things out of things such as uh, Irreversible, the film, which is, is unbelievably dark, but unbelievably amazing. But it's it's edgy. You're all, and particularly in America, you're always at that point that if you took it too far, you might not have a job the next day. Yeah. So 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 that 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 has liberated people, and that's why that's why I think in a way, it you don't quite need the technical experience that you needed before because people really it took took years to dominate negative control. You know, exposure control of the negative. It really took a long time and a lot of watching to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And now, all that's gone. So you know you have a set you have to set a safety net and that gives you the freedom to to be creative and I think that's generally why things are better. I actually use the the pandemic <laughs> not to watch amazing things like that. I, I went onto Netflix and watched you know one after the other of Almodovar's films because I needed a laugh. You know so so I sort of I enjoyed that process and that Almodovar's films are not particularly well lit. You know until you get to Abliconia, which is which is really a great piece of work, but it was never, you know, it was the style of the time, you know, it belongs to a certain period. Um, and that, and that's, that's interesting enough for, you know, and I think for anybody, anybody younger looking at, as well as looking at contemporary things, you know, such as Dune, uh, you know, uh, the, the new Blade Runner, things like that, you know, which are all brilliantly lit. Um, it's, it's worth going back and seeing a little more of the history. And if you can find part of, Part of that history that was lit well in film, you know, so like by Conrad Hall, Vittorio Serraro, Bob Richardson, Darius Conji, uh, Emmanuel Lubetsky, you know, you can you can go back to all of those people and understand understand how how good they were and how good their films are in terms of the their lighting and and their ability to control a negative. But we're definitely in a we in in our post film stage, which we are. Uh, the quality of cinematography has, has jumped massively. Well, thank you so much for letting me in, uh, interview you today. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Uh, and that's it for this week. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses. And of course, follow us on uh, Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.